Good morning, welcome. I am Shavonda Jacobs-Young, USDA Undersecretary for Research, Education and Economics and the USDA Chief Scientist. I'm pleased to welcome you to this event. This is an exciting day for the US Department of Agriculture and I'm honored to be a part of it. Even more significantly, it's an important day for the American people. Today, USDA announces a new initiative, Ascend for Better Health that is focused on using food and nutrition to reduce the risk of diet-related chronic diseases, including cancer, especially in historically underserved populations. This is a major, almost superhuman challenge that will require imaginative solutions. As you'll hear shortly, because of the vital work we'll, we will do in the new center, Americans from all walks of life will have access to comprehensive cutting edge science on the power of nutrition. It will bring existing knowledge to, into clearer focus while serving as a spur to newer, even more innovative solutions. By creating a flexible structure for coordination, synchroni synchronization, and cooperation, it will inject new life into our understanding and capacity to defeat cancer. This project is part of a government-wide effort to change the face of cancer as we know it. And it requires enormous cross-collaborative intellectual labor. In other words, an amassing of brain power that transcends disciplinary and institutional boundaries. Fortunately, we're operating from a position of strength. USDA has some of the finest scientists and researchers anywhere in the world. Pulling their talents with those of our academic and private sector colleagues will ensure ASCEND serves as an anti-cancer nerve center of the federal government and beyond. Mind you, we are not naive. We recognize the issue is complex and may take some time, but we do believe that with this new resource, we may be able to accelerate the arrival of that glorious day when cancer, like other diseases, is in our past and has been vanquished from our lives agriculture will do our part. By helping people eat smarter, we can significantly reduce the risk of certain cancers. Ascend is a key element in the cancer moonshot that President Biden revitalized in February of this year. He established ambitious goals, reduce the death rate from cancer by at least 50% over the next 25 years, and improve the experience of people and their families living with, with and surviving cancer. As part of the moonshot, the White House convenes the Cancer Cabinet regularly, including Secretary of Agriculture Bill Sack, from whom we'll be hearing from shortly. That cabinet works in five priority areas. One, close the screening gap between groups and races. Two, understand and address environmental exposure. Three, decrease the impact of preventable cancers. Four, bring cutting edge research through the pipelines to patients and communities, and five, support patients and caregivers. ASCEND will play a vital role in priority three, decreasing the impact of preventable cancers and priority four, bringing innovative research to patients and communities. We at USDA and our colleagues throughout government won't rest until cancer is defeated comprehensively. Cancer is one of the biggest health challenges confronting us today. With this announcement, I know that together we are on the road to end cancer as we know it. Before I introduce Secretary Vilsack to make the official announcement, I'd like to invite Dr. Danielle Carnival, White House Cancer Moonshot Coordinator to provide more information on the broader anti-cancer effort and how USDA fits in. Dr. Carnival. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs Young. Thank you, Secretary Vilsack and USDA for hosting this event um, on the, the um, precipice of this great, great initiative. And thanks for having me participate. To provide a little bit more on the cancer moonshot, in February, President Biden reignited the cancer moonshot uh, that he started originally in 2016 and set bold new goals to decrease the death rate by cancer by at least 50% over the next 25 years, and to improve the experience of people, their families and caregivers living with and surviving cancer. This means investing in research and innovation to develop new ways to prevent, detect, and treat cancer. It also means making sure that we reach more Americans with the tools we already have and those we develop along the way. 
This is possible because of decades of progress. Over the first 20 years of this century, the age-adjusted death rate from cancer in the U.S. has fallen by about 25%. That means people are living uh, longer uh, after being diagnosed with cancer and even surviving cancer. That was enabled by progress on many fronts. We have targeted treatments and immunotherapies, the HPV vaccine, improved mammograms, CT scans, and colonoscopies that can detect cancers or precancers early when there are good options for treatment and prevention. And we've seen dramatic decreases in long-term cigarette use, especially in young people. As I said, the Cancer Moonshot mission started in 2016 when then Vice President Biden led an effort to double the rate of progress against cancer, a goal to which so many probably here um, on this line and throughout the cancer community and beyond responded with passion, ingenuity, and commitment. When President Biden took office, he was determined to supercharge that work and bring his leadership and a whole of government effort back to the cancer moonshot. He often says we, he wants to end cancer as we know it. And so we really addressed how this meant changing the reality of how too many Americans today experience cancer. For example, we often uh, diagnose it too late. We have too, uh, too few tools or do too little to prevent it. There are stark inequities in diagnosis, access to treatments and trials and outcomes. We know too little about how to target treatments to the right patients. We lack good strategies to develop treatments for some types of cancers, like our deadliest diagnoses, rare in childhood cancers. We leave too many patients and caregivers to navigate the disease and its aftermath on their own, and we don't learn from the experiences of most patients. In each of these areas, the good news is we can point to a new approach to caring for patients or a new innovation that can be brought to make progress. So we really offer that agenda as a shared agenda. We know so many are already contributing, but if you have ideas, personal stories, new actions, and new collaborations, please share them at whitehouse.gov slash cancer moonshot. The big part of the renewed cancer moonshot is we formed a first ever cancer cabinet, which brings us here today. This is driving the whole of government effort to unleash every possible asset within our power. This includes the Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Labor, to the Department of Veterans Affairs, Energy, Environmental Protection Agency, and many others, including, of course, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. As um, Dr. Jacobs Young uh, laid out, they set out priority actions across screening and environmental and toxic exposure, preventing cancer, driving innovative research and supporting patients and caregivers. And today USDA kicks off a week of action for the cancer moonshot. This will feature new actions across the cancer cabinet that will build on work that federal agencies and departments contributed since February. The topic, uh, the work that is the topic of this event is an important aspect of the, of the cancer moonshot and builds on the president's leadership, including at the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. I'm sure you will hear the impact that prevention, especially through improved nutrition, can make on cancer diagnoses and outcomes. So I thank you all for being a part of this important step. Follow along uh, this week of action using hashtag cancer moonshot and hashtag week of action. And we are so excited for the launch of the Ascend program. So I turn it back over to the USDA. Thanks for uh, having me join. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Carnival, for that overview and for your leadership of the president's cancer moonshot effort. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Secretary Tom Vilsack to share the official announcement about our new initiative. We are so fortunate to have Secretary Vilsack's strong leadership on this initiative and in the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Mr. Secretary, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dick Jung. Thanks very much for your leadership of our RE mission area, which is an incredibly important aspect of USDA. And so I want to thank Dr. Carnival as well for her overview and leadership of the president's cancer moonshot effort. You know, at USDA, we're working to ensure a vibrant food and agricultural system that produces safe, abundant, and affordable food supplies for all Americans, especially those who are most vulnerable to food and nutrition insecurity. We also provide dietary guidelines to help all Americans to live their healthiest lives. But the reality is we still have a national food problem. Diet-related chronic diseases, cancer, obesity, heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes continue to be on the rise. And we recognize that when it comes to using food and nutrition to improve health-related outcomes for individuals, we cannot take a one-size-fits-all approach. We know that people respond differently to food based on age, a sex, genetics, and the environment. We know that the food selection is a complex process. 
influenced by so many factors, including food availability, economics, and cultural and social contexts. The bottom line is that we need to develop a more precise understanding of how we interact with food. What factors influence our food choices and how our genetics and environment lead to specific health-related outcomes, especially in historically underserved populations? To address these challenges today, I, along with Dr. Jacobs Young, am proud to announce the establishment at USDA of the Virtual Agricultural Science Center of Excellence for Nutrition and Diet for Better Health, or ASCEND for Better Health. ASCEND will bring together scientists, partner organizations, and communities to develop and to deliver science-based solutions that improve the health and well-being of all Americans, particularly in underserved communities. Our goals of ASCEND are really three. One, we want to coordinate precision and nutrition research, education, and extension activities. Two, we want to cultivate innovative ideas and novel approaches. And three, we want to speed the delivery of results through collaboration and harmonization. Immediately, the virtual center will connect existing resources, including people and programs, to leverage expertise and increase coordination and cooperation. USDA currently invests over $180 million in intra and extramural uh, nutrition related research. And ASCEND will help to coordinate and evaluate precision nutrition science to better understand the relationships of food and nutrition within specific populations, particularly in historically underserved communities. Let me give you an example. Our ARS Human nu uh, Nutrition Center in North Dakota is partnering with Native American and As uh, Native Alaskans to more precisely understand their nutritional needs, their diet, and the composition of indigenous foods. Our future research will utilize this information to develop dietary options using indigenous foods that lead to improved health-related outcomes. We're also conducting research on the relationship of food, nutrition, and cancer. USDA's Human, research, Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging at Tufts University is exploring how components of the diet modify cellular pathways leading to cancer and how other factors such as genetic background and alcohol consumption can interact with nutrition to determine cancer risk. Our researchers are also expanding our understanding of the anti-inflammatory role of bioactive components of fruits and vegetables and developing complementary dietary agents that prevent that inflammation. ASCEND will also capitalize on public-private partnerships and focus on partnering with communities early and often. And these partnerships are essential for building the trust and relationships needed to translate research into impactful solutions across diverse communities. Everyone needs a voice at the table, including researchers, nonprofits, universities, extension, community leaders, faith-based organizations, and especially those with lived experience to discuss the opportunities and challenges for improving health through better nutrition. We need to focus these discussions on specific populations, since the opportunities and challenges may well differ depending on factors such as culture or stage of life. To begin these conversations, we're also announcing today that our first community engagement meeting will be held on January 31st, 2023, in partnership with Southern University, which currently hosts a Center of Excellence on Health, Wellness, and Quality of Life for African Americans. This meeting will focus on diet-related disparities faced by African Americans who bear a disproportional burden of chronic diet-related diseases. USDA is going to provide more details about participation in this and future community engagements uh, across the country very soon. And we plan to share what we learn and use the information to help inform future hearings and research efforts, as well as developing new opportunities for program delivery. You'll be hearing uh, about this uh, throughout uh, the next several months. Finally, this effort is not just about cancer, as important as cancer is. Cancer is certainly a critical challenge and provides the context for this announcement, but improving our health and well-being through food and nutrition has many benefits, including the reduction of obesity, type two diabetes, health disease, as well as cancer. We have an opportunity before us uh, to address one of the most significant challenges that our society currently faces. And by working together, uh, the president is convinced we can make a difference and we intend to do so. So again, I want to thank uh, Dr. Carnival and Dr. Jacobs Young for the leadership on this effort, and I look forward to uh, 
further announcements in the near future. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for all of your leadership in this area as well. And I know that this is something that you're very passionate about, and we greatly appreciate all of your support. Now, in this next segment, I'd like to take some time to personalize the discussion. Talk about why this initiative is so important and why we should care about the opportunity to reduce the risk of diet-related chronic diseases through food and nutrition. When it comes to these diseases, there are many factors that are out of our control, but we know that food is not one of them. This is where we can all take the reins and steer firmly in a different direction. I think it's so important for all of us to consider this very carefully because diet-related chronic diseases impacts all of us or nearly all of us. Um, you know, I, re I, I frequently share a story, and I think it's maybe shocking to some, but unfortunately very familiar to others. Well, there are several people in my family who died, you know, in the age, at age 50, somewhere between 50 and 55, for example. Um, my sister just last year at, at age 50, vulnerable from diet-related diseases like diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, ca cardiovascular disease, and yes, cancer. So I'm very passionate about helping many communities because I know that we can, we can turn the tide on this. Do you have a personal experience or a perspective on, on this topic that you'd like to share, Secretary Vilsack? Well, the sad reality is that uh, every single member of my adopted family uh, my father, my mother, and my sister uh, died at a very relatively early age. Uh, my father from heart disease, uh, my mother from cancer, uh, and my sister from uh, the flu that ultimately uh, devastated her heart, and, and she died uh, when her heart transplant uh, was rejected. So uh, all of those individuals had health-related circumstances, uh, choices which they made which I suspect accelerated uh, the disease that ultimately took their life. So nutrition has also been a, a critical component of my life. I, I've always struggled uh, with my own weight. Um, it, it's always been a real challenge for me in terms of knowing precisely what I should be eating and what I should avoid. So this notion of precision agriculture, never, or be precision nutrition rather, is so incredibly important because it's gonna give individuals and groups of individuals, the kind of information that will allow them to make informed choices. I mean, guys, sometimes we have a tendency to think one size fits all, but what we now know because of science, that is not the case. It is very much uh, individual. And so to the extent that we can provide this information, people can then make more informed and better choices. And we frankly uh, can also tailor our programs in a way that speaks to the lived experience of those who are participating, you know, I'm, I'm challenged by the fact that our WIC program, only 50% of people eligible participate. Our SNAP program, uh, senior citizens do not participate at a very high level. So all of these individuals, if we can get information that's really relevant to them, uh, then we'll see greater participation and we'll see better health outcomes. Yes, absolutely. Um, when I look at the lifespan, what the, the average lifespan for you know America, we know it's been impacted by the pandemic, but the thought that many of our family members have lost somewhere between 20 and 30 years of their of their lifespan. Um, and some things on some topics that we can turn the tide today. I, I'm often out in the community and I'm talking to lots of our stakeholders and um, I've had to be extremely vulnerable because I want people to know that um, I'm, I'm, I'm one, of, one of the community. I'm not any different than anybody else. And so um, living with type 2 diabetes, living with hypertension, and recognizing the importance of diet and nutrition for me to have a healthy life, to be able to um, function and to be able to manage those chronic conditions and, and still be very, very, um, have a high quality life and be very active. And so I know the importance of diet and nutrition. And so I'm just so happy we have a chance to talk about this. Um, and so so I, let's talk a little bit more about the importance of engaging with at-risk populations and those with lived experiences early and often in the process of program development. I know that we had the White House Congress uh, Conference on Hunger and Nutrition and Health. You know, are there any, are there any you know, takeaways or tidbits you might share with us today about this importance of engaging with those populations, those at-risk populations? 
Well, I, I think it has to do with the fact that our programs may not be specifically designed uh, in the way they need to be designed to be able to, to address the, the challenges or concerns. We, we talked a lot at the uh, conference about nutrition security, uh, the need for uh, individuals to have access to affordable, healthy foods, the, the, the ability to have uh, meaningful benefits that will allow them to, to uh, afford that food, and the translation of science uh, into everyday language so that people can understand how to use dietary and nutrition science and with an equity focus. And so when we look at Ascend, we, we, we're essentially looking at basically almost all of those components. Uh, let me give you an example. We know on college campuses, for example, this is, a, th now this is a, a group that you wouldn't necessarily think about when you think about this issue. Uh, but the reality is there are a lot of young people going to school today who are uh, single parents. Uh, who are struggling financially uh, to try to do the job, to try to get to college, to try to take the courses and also raise a family. Well, the reality is that oftentimes they need food assistance programs. And we would, we would establish food assistance programs through a community college or a university. And then we would wonder why <laughs> they aren't being taken up, why they're not being utilized. Well, it's because we didn't do the job that needs to be done to reach out to people and say, how does this ha have to be structured? How does it have to be uh, uh, designed so that it will be most convenient for you to use? And that, in fact, uh, we're doing this on a number of our programs. We're doing this with WIC right now. We're spending some resources to try to figure out, well, why is it that only 50% of participants in WIC are currently participating? What, those who are eligible, what about that other 50%? What is it about their lived experience that makes it difficult for them? Why don't uh, seniors uh, take better advantage of SNAP, uh, for example? So I, I think the, the key here uh, for Ascend is to, is to facilitate the conversations with those who have lived experience, link that to researchers, link it to the universities, link it to our programs, so that we can have a, a, a better, we can do a better job of designing those programs and implementing them. Uh, and we can do a better job of translating the science in a way that ordinary folks can understand. Yes, absolutely. We we had some amazing participants in the in the conference, and um, just the, the the lessons we learned about the lived experience and having those individuals at the table at the beginning of program planning and development, um, and then the cultural awareness that needs to be in place um, for many of our of our populations. And so um, this this talk talk early and talk often is something that Ascend will, you know, we're gonna kick it off on, G on January 31st. And so could you explain or talk about the importance of extension, you know, and nutrition education and translating research to the public, you know, having been ARS administrator for eight years, I know how important it is, all of the important research we do. So let's talk about extension. And so how important is our extension and cooperators across America and helping us to, to meet the goals here? Well, I think it's about trust. It begins with uh, trust and, and essentially extension at various levels has, has developed over a period of time, a trusting relationship with ordinary folks. Um, uh, when you think about ag extension, when you think about university extension, when you think about the work that we do with our ARS facilities in partnership, uh, it, it's essentially a trusted source. Uh, and so if you're going to have a conversation, if you're going to have a circumstance where you're listening, where you want people to share, you know, it's hard to share with somebody that you don't trust or that you don't have a relationship with. Uh, you feel comfortable uh, talking to Extension because you've talked to them before on a variety of other issues. And so it starts with that trusting relationship. Um, and I think it's an opportunity for us, uh, again, uh, to, to learn from that trusting relationship how better to design the educational components of some of our programs. We have a SNAP-Ed program, for example. How can we help states do a better job of understanding how they, too, uh, can communicate with, with, with potential beneficiaries so that, again, we get that information out? Uh, and frankly, you know, uh, you mentioned the, the cultural differences. If you don't understand those cultural differences, if, if, if you're not in a position to understand the language that needs to be used to, to, to anticipate the, the skepticism that may be met with certain uh, ideas, then you're not going to be in a position to do as effective a job of communicating as we need. Uh, and so that's why it's important uh, for us to, to, to utilize these trusting relationships. 
you know, our uh, food nutrition services is an important, uh, I think, an important partner uh, to bring into this effort uh, with our nutrition hubs in an effort to try to make sure that the right hand knows what the left hand is doing relative to USDA. And when you combine that with what's going on with the research community, with communities of interest, now all of a sudden you've got a very uh, tight, coordinated, uh, collaborative set of communications taking place that will actually get the, the, the necessary information to people uh, in a way that will be accepted by them and, and trusted by them, which is, I think, incredibly important. And Extension plays just an amazing role in that, spe in that space. Yeah, I, I think that USDA has like an amazing capacity, the gift of the capacity that we have to, to conduct the research, to, to find out what people need to be able to conduct the research. We have hundreds of breeders where we can go in and we can breed in um, important traits into crops and animals that are critically important to diet and nutrition. And then we feed so many people every day in the programs that are um, implemented and delivered by USDA. So we, we, we pack a, a real powerful punch when it comes to being able to make headway in this space. Um, you know, I know people are probably saying, well, you know, how is a sin for better health different than other efforts? So what's 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 unique about a sin? Well, I think it's uh, a recognition that we have to change uh, uh, the focus and direction uh, of how we learn and how we approach this issue of nutrition, security and nutrition and, and, and diet related diseases. Uh, for many, many years, the research that we've conducted has been pretty much a whole population approach uh, and, and basically focused on nutrient deficiencies. You know, what particular vitam, uh, vitamin, for example, were we deficient in? And what that did is it, it allowed the food industry information that would in turn enable them to better fortify foods and to improve the overall general nutrition of whatever it is they were uh, providing to consumers. But when you, when you realize the, the need for food and nutrition research to, to, to focus on specific health-related outcomes, now what you have to do is you have to tailor, you have to be more precise, you have to better understand the interactions between an individual uh, and various individuals and that food product um, and, and, and how this relates to or can contribute to or prevent or reduce the risk of diet-related chronic diseases. Now, all of a sudden, it's not one size fits all. And now it's really more precise, more specific. Uh, and that, that outlines a completely different approach to the research, different approach to the communication of the research. And that's why Ascend for Better Health is, is really in part designed to allow us and help us focus and expand that precise uh, focus, that precision nutrition research um, to, to order, in order to not only do a better job of creating the research, but also as well to accelerate the translation of that research into ways in which ordinary folks can, can appreciate. We've got, as you well know, uh, six human nutrition research centers. Uh, and I think we're gonna see those, those hubs, those centers uh, develop more a focus on precision nutrition uh, as a new and emerging area of research. And so I'm excited about that. Uh, we should see an expansion of social and behavioral science as well as economic research in terms of what we're doing at USDA. And I think once we get that research, once we get the precision research, then Ascend's also going to increase the communication and coordination across that research so that we can sort of join it together, leverage it, uh, better understand it. And once we better understand it, then be able to communicate it more effectively and engage uh, early and often. Uh, at-risk populations. The goal, obviously, over the long haul is to coordinate all of this uh, in an effort to try to get relevant information to people that they trust, that they then use to make better health decisions and diet decisions, which results ultimately in a reduction of, of cancer and a reduction of chronic uh, diet-related diseases. This is, um, you know, hearing, hearing, just hearing your comments and knowing how how much effort has gone into plan and ascend. Um, just, I get so excited about the potential of ascend. And um, now you, you sit on the cancer cabinet and um, we know it's, it's critically important that ag be at the table. 
Can you talk a little bit about how a Stand for Better Health fits within the broader efforts? And, and when you and your colleagues come together, you know, how do you see a sin playing a, a role in the in the big goal that we have with the cancer moonshot? Well, I, you know, I think it, it, it's predominantly a, a focus on prevention. Uh, at the end of the day, we know that there are multiple uh, gateways, if you will, uh, to cancer uh, that we need to shut off, that we need to we need to end or, or 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 derail, and we know that proper nutrition and better diets will be part of the solution in terms of bringing down that risk. Some of the cabinet members are are involved in, in well, what, once you have cancer, how do you basically mitigate its consequences? Others are are interested in uh, understanding more of the environmental impacts uh, that may impact and affect cancer. So we at USDA, I think we're focused on a particularly significant component, uh, and that is diet and, and di diet related uh, uh, issues. And, and to the extent that we can do better research, we can coordinate that research, that we can translate it more effectively, we can get it to specific populations and it can be used because it's trusted. Now, all of a sudden, we, we're in a position to help reduce the rate of cancer the rate of chronic related diseases that may lead to uh, more uh, uh, adverse consequences for folks. That obviously takes the stress as well off those who are responsible for trying to mitigate the consequences of cancer that occurs. Uh, that takes the stress off the hospitals. It takes the stress off the doctors. It, it allows the research, the cancer research to be even more focused so that we end up uh, understanding cures and things of that nature. So what we can do here is by reducing the rate, we free up resources to accelerate uh, the, the treatment, which in turn ultimately reduces the number of people uh, who have suffered what you've suffered and, and what I've suffered, which is uh, when your mom and your dad's not there to see you college uh, graduation ceremony, uh, my dad died three weeks before I graduated from college, or your mom's not there to witness your first child, which occurred in my life. My mom died a month and a half before my first son was born. Or your sister doesn't have an opportunity to see you become uh, elected uh, a governor of a state, uh, which uh, occurred in, in my family. All of that is a, is a pain. It, it's a it's an emptiness. It's a it's a hole that just never gets filled. Proper diet, better nutrition, more information can help us reduce those circumstances in families across America. Uh, and especially in those uh, who are most uh, potentially at risk uh, because of, of, of decisions or information they don't have about proper nutrition. Absolutely. You, you almost told my story there at the, you know, it went your comments. Um, and to live higher quality lives, so not just be alive, but be alive. And um, I, I'm really excited about the initiative. I'm so happy, Secretary Vilsack, that you joined us this morning to help um, and to make this big announcement. And I think that the um, community can be assured that both of us are extremely passionate and committed to this effort. And um, I look forward to continuing to work with you as we move the needle on this topic and um, would like to give you the last word from our time together. Well, I would just simply say, make no mistake about this. This is personal. Yeah. It's personal. Um, I talked about my, myself. I, I could easily talk about Christy, my wife, who, whose mother died at age 16 when she was 16. Uh, and that, that impacts and affects your life forever. Uh, the goal here is to do a better job at USDA to help folks do a better job of taking care of themselves so that we have a stronger, better country. Uh, and we are very, very committed to that here at USDA. Thank you so much, Secretary Vilsack. Thank you. So now we will switch gears a bit and talk about some of the very exciting scientific efforts that are advancing our ability to use food and nutrition for improving health-related outcomes. It's a real pleasure for me to welcome today, Dr. Selena Ahmad, who is the Global Director of the Periodic Table of Food Initiative. Selena, we look forward to learning more about this effort. The floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction and it is an honor to be here today as part of this monumental announcement. Can you see my slides? 
A tomorrow exists in which farmers intentionally cultivate specific foods to reduce the incidence of cancer. A tomorrow where each person is empowered to select diets to match their cultural preferences and access to support their vitality and overcome genetic predispositions. This tomorrow sees food not only as a tool to solve hunger, but as an essential life source to support our collective well-being and overcome health disparities. The periodic table of food initiative is ushering in this tomorrow by unlocking the vast potential of food in ways we have not been able to do before. We are taking a globally coordinated approach and harnessing the latest science and technology to map food in its entirety and to make this knowledge accessible to all. This mission is well aligned with the USDA's new Ascend initiative, and I look forward to partnership. Science including advances by the USDA, has made major strides in cataloging our food supply. Just the way the elements are organized in a periodic table, we can think about the thousands of components in our food, the macronutrients, the micronutrients, the specialized metabolites, such as those that are anti-inflammatory, and other components that enter food through production practices. However, for these lesser known components, those specialized metabolites, while evidence indicates that some might boast, bolster our health and be protective, and others may have adverse effects in different dosages, the science is insufficient to enable the medical community to make precise recommendations for food as a tool to combat disease. Moreover, these known components are only a fraction of what is in our food. There are thousands of unknown components in our food. Our periodic table of food is incomplete. We don't know what these food components are, nor what they do for our health. Even for the most commonly known foods, our discovery data is showing that there are thousands of unknown compounds yet to be discovered. Precision nutrition, which may be one of the most effective tools for improving our health, will be out of reach until we can deploy robust, and standardized technology to understand the vast resources of food. For the first time in history, with global coordination and advanced analytics, we can imagine knowing all the components in food. The periodic table of food initiative is using the most cutting edge technology, including omics technology and artificial intelligence to provide standardized tools data and training to empower partners around the world to map our global food supply and to make this knowledge accessible in a cohesive database. Standardization is key to this approach. We are integrating standardized approaches from existing and traditional food composition databases that track about 150 commonly known components with the novel approaches of omics to track thousands of components in food. By designing tools that are relatively low cost, we seek to build capacity of scientists to catalog all the world's food supply, including indigenous foods, the thousands of species that make up the planet's edible biodiversity. Global coordination and training are central to our mission. No single lab, institution, or country can analyze the world's food supply. It takes a global village. We are thus empowering a global ecosystem to lead this charge. Education alone is not enough. We need education to really translate research into community impacts, as was highlighted earlier. Thus, at the Periodic Table of Food Initiative, we seek to build capacity of everybody in food and health systems through our new open source educational effort, Good Food You, to train future scientists and professionals to translate robust data for community education in ways that drive change. With this expanding knowledge of food, we are at the brink of a data-driven revolution to make more precise agricultural decisions and dietary recommendations for different populations. 
In doing so, we need to move away from a reductionist approach focused on single food components to one that examines food in the context in which we live. We need to re-establish linkages between food, the environment, agriculture, and health. For example, eating more fruits and vegetables is prevalent dietary guidance, but which food, from which farming practices, which foods are more suitable for specific individuals based on their predispositions and food access. A growing body of evidence indicates that food components vary based on farming practices and that different individuals can vary in their biological responses to different food components. Food access where I live in the state of Montana varies. I work with tribal communities on food and nutrition projects and interventions. Through these experiences, it is clear that we need more precise recommendations for different contexts based on their cultural context for addressing inequities and health disparities in the food system. In conclusion, when we better know our food, we are empowered to apply that knowledge to transform our food system to one that is more accessible and nourishing. In speaking of tomorrow, we must acknowledge the past. I wanted to honor all of the indigenous and other communities that have long recognized the connections between food and health and imparted this worldview for the management of disease. Thank you. Dr. Amid Selena, thank you for that very exciting presentation. We look forward to seeing further advances in this initiative and welcome opportunities to partner together in the future as opportunities arise. I'd like to now turn to the last part of our program, which features a panel of experts who will discuss innovation, science, and delivery with an emphasis on the importance of translating science with impact for communities especially for historically underserved populations. Joining us today are Dr. Nigel Brockton, Vice President of Research at the American Institute for Cancer Research, Dr. Ronnie Bell, who was recently named the Chair of the Division of Pharmaceutical Outcomes and Policy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and Dr. Fatima Malikian, who is a Professor of Food Science, Director of Southern University Institute for Food, Nutrition and Wellness, and Director of Center of Excellence for Nutrition, Health, Wellness and Quality of Life at Southern University Agricultural Research and Extension Center. I'd like to get thoughts from each of you on the following questions. And Nigel, I'll ask you to go first. Can you talk about the importance of partnerships, particularly with community-based organizations and at-risk populations to achieve the shared goal of improving human health through food and nutrition? And what are some of the populations that you've worked with and what are some of the lessons learned and what are the key opportunities going forward? Dr. Brockton? Thank you and thank you for inviting me to participate in this uh, panel. Um, so the American Institute for Cancer Research are the global uh, authority on diet, nutrition, physical activity and cancer. And our focus is really on getting this information to the, to the general public, the broader, broadest uh, audience we can. Um, but we do that by working with partners. The, the evidence that we synthesize, so really distinguishing evidence from opinion, uh, on the role of these risk factors, excuse me for the background noise, um, uh, is used by lots of other organizations. Some of the national organizations like ASCO and uh, sorry, American Society for Clinical Oncology, who are really the professional body for oncologists, uh, the American Cancer Society, who are you know, one of the biggest uh, funders and distributors of information to the cancer population but also with individual clinics, uh, with communities, uh, people like the YMCA, the cancer support community. So it's really to, um, to amplify and enhance and, and get this information into the hands of people that can really use it. Thank you, Dr. Brockton. Dr. Malikian, um, let's, can we hear from you, please? Well, Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to represent uh, 
or uh, 89 new university and I hope and I've told them that I hope I do a good job this is a big load on my shoulder but I, I'm very happy to be here as a part of you know community-based organization is crucial to whatever we do because especially in underserved communities you have to be in the community connect with them in order to reach uh you know the the individuals and um, you know, with the experience that we have had at Southern University, one of the 18, 90 universities in the nation, and you all know we have 19 and majority of them are located in the Southern re region of United States, which we have a lot of health issues. So we have been in the community, in the heart of community, working directly with individual. And I can tell you the things that we have learned through Center of Excellence is that it's, it's hard. And it, there are a lot of challenges when it comes to trust. I know Secretary Wiltsack uh, touched on that and said that we need and we have to work on that issue to bring people on table. What we have learned for going forward is that, as I said earlier, we need to meet people where they are. We need to go to the community and be passionate about what we do. If you are not passionate and you don't have, an extension actually plays a critical role. Southern University is located in the heart of underserved communities in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So that's just one of the 89. As I said, the rest of them are the same. So it is important for us to build that trust, to work together at all levels. You know, it doesn't matter um, if you are rich or you are poor or anything else, and get the community on the table from the beginning. You can wait and plan for people's lives without them being on the table and tell you what they want and what is it that they need. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. And you're doing a fabulous job. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Bell. Yes, thank you. I'm very honored to be a part of this, um, this panel and this discussion today. And, um, having the opportunity to speak on behalf of uh, American Indian populations across the, the U.S. Uh, I am an enrolled member of the Lumbee tribe here in North Carolina. North Carolina has uh, the largest American Indian population in the eastern United States. And so a lot of the work that I do uh, is uh, in, in those populations, in those tribal communities. And as has already been mentioned, I just want to acknowledge uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed and the, the respect that she showed to indigenous people in her presentation. Um, but as has been mentioned, uh, American Indian populations have you know, the highest rates of diabetes uh, in the U.S. of any racial and ethnic minority population. Um, the, the cancers where we see the, the greatest disparities in American Indian populations are for gastrointestinal related cancers. And so uh, obviously this is a very important issue and I'm very, very grateful um, to Secretary Vilsack and the USDA for their Indigenous uh, Food Sovereignty Initiative and, and President Biden's uh, the Tribal Health Summit from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, those are the types of things that, that are really, really, really important. You know, the um, um, unfortunately, there's a, a very uh, bad history with tribal communities with the influx of uh, commodity foods into into reservations and um, with with policies that have impacted access to healthy foods in tribal communities. So developing these partnerships, uh, you know, with tribal leadership, with tr uh, tribal elders, with um, uh, you know, leaders within tribal communities is also important, but also having the ability to understand and recognize that, you know, we have over 579 um, uh, federally recognized tribes in the U.S., over 200 non-federally recognized tribes. And so each tribe has its own unique history, its own unique culture, and having the ability to, uh, uh, to partner with tribal communities uh, is, is critical in, in addressing some of these disparities that we see in this population. Thank you, thank you for that, certainly. 
Uh, so let's talk a little bit about where we've fallen short in translating and transferring the latest science into actionable information that community groups, health organizations, and others working in the field can use. What are some of the specific ideas for moving forward and ways we can, ways we can be better? Um, so why don't we start with you, um, Dr. Malakian. You're, you're muted. Sorry. 1890 universities' presence and especially extension uh, component of these land grant universities is crucial in reaching the communities. What we have done for the Center of Excellence, you know, we have used research based materials, but we develop a fact sheet as soon as we see something that is a very, you know, a little difficult for people to understand. We try to develop this fact sheet at the sixth or eighth level. So everybody could relate to it. We don't want to use so many of the scientific words that even some of the scientists have a hard time to relate to, you know. So we bring it to the level they, uh, that they can read, they can understand. We put graphic in there. And then another thing is that we have to make sure, as we said earlier, the culture, the language is is, is considered on developing any educational material because we don't have just one uh, English language right now. There are so many different languages that we need to translate our material and make sure that anything that we do in research, it comes to, to the public that they can understand. Another thing that I think is very important, these days technology, artificial intelligence goes a long way. Everybody has a cell phone. That's the only way I think that right now, if we talk about technology, we can reach almost, almost everybody through sending messages, having programs or the fact she's simple language, a couple of points of what they are doing of what they are eating, how it can affect them. We have a, an artificial intelligence. We are working presently with L-L-E-N-A-A, -A, Lena, which is an app for diabetes. This app would tell people they can download it. We train them. They can download it and ask for different menus and how to make them, where to get the ingredient. They can go buy it or it can be delivered. Uh, they are connected to so many, so many stores and things like that. I think it makes people more joining and coming on board. I know there are other apps available. So it's just uh, knowing who your um audience are, reach them where they are, and connect with them in knowing the culture. The uh, product should be culturally sensitive, economically sensitive. And, uh, you know, I don't think we have done this yet to the extent that it needs to be done. So moving forward, we need to concentrate on educating uh, the communities at the level that they are. Perfect, thank you. Dr. Bell. Yes, I think um, where we have fallen short in the past is that we've kind of assumed that there's a one size fits all approach that not only do our uh, initiatives, our research, our education, uh, if, it, if it works in one population, it's going to work in all populations. Certainly, that's that approach is not going to work. But even, you know, even as I mentioned, there's such a diversity, you know, within the umbrella of, of people that we refer to as Indigenous or American Indian Alaska Native. And so I think we're doing a better job with that. I appreciate the work of the uh, the USD Office of Tribal Relations in, you know, providing resources that are unique to um, regions of the country or even uh, the specific tribes. And so um, I feel like there, there's more and more intentionality around uh, understanding the unique uh, culture and heritage of, of tribal communities. I, I think, too, uh, having the ability to um, 
to train uh, native people to to do research within their own communities or uh, to, to even uh, provide um, uh, provide healthcare or provide um, uh, you know focused initiatives around food sovereignty I think is a very important uh, uh, c- component of the work that needs to be done moving forward. Absolutely. Oh, um, Dr. Brockton. So I think one demonstration of how we've fallen short is uh, every few years, the American Institute of Cancer Research does a risk factor, cancer risk factor awareness survey. And what we find is there's about half of the population that are completely unaware of the strong evidence that relates dietary factors like alcohol, like obesity, uh, like red and processed meat. You know, they they realize that smoking is related to to cancer, but there's this huge portion of society that are unaware of these risk factors. And then on the flip side, you have people that are like, we know this, why are you telling us this again? So we really have to get to those populations. And one of the ways we're trying to do that, we have some very user-friendly tools like the Cancer Health Check. So if you go to cancerhealthcheck.org, Uh, the website. It's like a two or three minute, very user friendly uh, survey that you select how you are, you know, you answer a few questions and it gives you a very quick feedback on how well you're meeting the cancer prevention recommendations. In in very simple language, it embeds some, it basically gives you smiley face if you're meeting the recommendations, a neutral face if you're partially meeting them, and a sort of frowny face if you're not, but it's just a very quick way to take a sort of pulse check on uh, on how you're doing in, in meeting the, the evidence-based recommendations that we already have. Um, and then sort of bolted onto that is the Healthy 10 Challenge, which is a totally free 10-week challenge uh, online. Um, it gives you a whole lot of information on how to meet each one of the recommendations each week. There's three emails to kind of keep you on track and motivated. So as, as I said before, we're just trying to put this information in the hands of the people that need it uh, and in the most user-friendly way. I, I, I need to go to that website and I need to take my, my two to three minute test. Uh, so thank you for sharing that with me. So it's my mycancercheck.com. Can you say it again, Dr. Brockton? Cancerhealthcheck.org. Cancerhealthcheck. Okay, perfect. Uh, I'm going to get that done today. <laughs> today. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, so we're, we're, we're just about at the end of our time together. However, I want to give you all an opportunity to, you know, there's, you know, what is your final take home message that you would like to share with us? And, uh, and Dr. Bell, I'm going to come to you first. Yeah, so thank you again for allowing me to be a part of this panel. I would I would say the take home message is that um, issues like this are are deeply embedded and and uh, uprooting those uh, issues will take time. And so it's it's just a matter of being patient, but setting the course uh, in in a correct path so we can get to where we need to be. But just um, you know being patient and and uh, and steadying the course. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Brockton. So like uh, Secretary Vilsack, I would say this is personal. Um, Everyone involved in this this mission to to try and reduce the burden of cancer, it's personal because it touches so many people's lives. Um, We do have evidence-based recommendations that we can share and you know, try and move people towards meeting those recommendations. Uh, we know now that adherence to those recommendations does reduce risk and improve outcomes. But I just spent three days last week uh, assessing the evidence in colorectal cancer survivorship. And that is a, an area, and in survivorship in general, where we really need intervention studies because the observational evidence really doesn't get us to a point where we can make recommendations that changing a behavior will actually change an outcome. So with this platform to try and really uh, emphasize the need for collaborations to do those intervention studies to get the strongest evidence 
to give the strongest advice to really change outcomes. So, so one of the one of the topics that we talk about a lot is is, is bridging the divide between uh, the, the the medical profession and you know our our, our ag and nutrition and diet professionals. Mm -hmm. And how we can we really bring those pieces together? And I think that's another place where sin is going to be so critically important. Um, we don't have a lack of capacity of effort. What we have is an opportunity to better connect those pieces um, that are happening. Um, and so I think that a sin is going to play a huge role in that. And then thinking about strategies like you know do incentives work. You know, so those are some of the questions that I know many of the professionals across the country and globally are working on and how do we connect those dots? So Dr. Malikian, I'm gonna turn the floor to you. Do you have a final take home message that you'd like to leave us with? Sure. Uh, with what we have learned under Center of Excellence uh, is that, you know, we must provide a, an equitable and sustainable uh, way of access to healthy, safe, nutritious and sufficient food for the community members where it needs their needs, you know, the daily needs. But as I said, it's gotta be sustainable because we have community gardens in the communities and we know that little by little people are coming to that and they are learning how to garden and how to you know, just grow their own food. The children are coming and it's wonderful to see all that. And providing all this, considering physical, social, and environmental status, and regardless of race, ethnicity, uh, culture, wealth, social status, political status, gender, age, etc. You know, we have a lot of a lot of words that we can list. So really with all of this, we can meet President Biden's goal to get, uh, you know, to reduce the cancer by at least 50% in 25 years, and also have a healthy community, a healthy city, a healthy state, a healthy nation, and be a role model for global, you know, health and well-being, because everybody is looking at United States, and it's just, we have been, and we will be, the role model for the nation and the whole world. So with that said, I really want to thank you all for having us on board on this panel. And, um, you know, we at Southern University, hoping that when we have our symposium, you all join us. I don't, we don't know the exact dates and the detail, but I hope you all join us. And we all together have to work together and bring our strength and our knowledge to be able to fight all the issues that we have related to food, nutrition, and health. And I agree, one size never fits all. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh my goodness. I, I just can't believe our time is up. I just want to thank the three of you for joining us today. And absolutely, Fatima, let us know, send the invite. I think it's yeah. critically important that we connect with organizations and cooperators and partners across the country that are already working so hard in your communities. And so there's no need to recreate the wheel. Let's join forces. And so- yes. Dr. Brockton, Dr. Bell, Dr. Malikian, thank you so much for joining us today. And I look forward to working with you um, going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, I can't believe how fast our time has gone today. And I wanna thank each of you sincerely for taking the time to be with us. I also wanna thank you for joining us virtually. I hope you enjoyed the event as much as I did. And I want to leave you with a call to action because there is much to do. We all have a part to play in this. Science can provide many solutions, but it's critically important that we all come together, including scientists and those from at-risk communities, which includes all of us, to establish the communication needed to identify the real problems, the real barriers and the real opportunities to change people's lives through better food and nutrition.
I encourage you to visit our Sin for Better Health homepage available at nutrition.gov. Very simple, nutrition.gov to sign up for the first community engagement session focused on diet-related health disparities in African-Americans that will take place at the end of January. We expect a lot of vibrant discussion and invite you to be a part of the discussion. So thank you again and have an amazing day.